Bud Wilson. I'm founder of Great Na uh, Deep Nature Journeys, and I'm here to uh, host and herd and keep everything moving. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce Peter Glick. And Peter uh, has just recently won the Carl Sagan Award for the popularization of science. You might think with Carl Sagan's legacy, there will be billions and billions and billions of winners. But no, that's not true. Peter is one of a very rare group. And we need to popularize science. So welcome, Peter. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you, those of you who made it. Thank you. Uh, Saturday morning is always difficult. Uh, I'm delighted that, that our day is having a water session uh, this, this year. Thank you to Sally and to Chip and to everyone who pushed for that. Uh, thanks to, to those of you who made it this morning to, to hear this. Uh, thank you to uh, Reverend Quiet and our Sioux elders for those words of wisdom. Anyone who works in water, or frankly, anyone who works on energy issues or environmental issues or natural resource issues, uh, I think appreciates the spiritual nature of what we do. It's, a, it's such an important part of what, what we do. This is a conference, uh, an organization devoted to renewable energy. And so you think, well, why water? Um, and I would, I would just have to say, why not water? Uh, you got up this morning, presumably you flushed your toilet, you maybe took a shower, you've had tea or coffee. Um, you turn on the faucet and water comes out. Uh, and we're fortunate that we turn on the faucet and the water comes out and we often don't really have a clue why that is. We know that somewhere it's raining or snowing and we know that somewhere we turn on our faucet and we really typically don't have a clue what happens in between. Uh, and that's a bit of a problem, the, that disconnect between the nature and the hydrologic cycle of the planet and the way we think about and use water. And yet, we've heard over the last several days, we've heard about natural capital and we've heard about innovative investing in technology and the climate crisis, and I wore my climate tie this morning, uh, and renewables and hydrogen and innovation, and all of those things are related to water. And if we think about forests or energy or climate or food or natural ecosystems or human health, that's water too. Uh, now, I work on water. Obviously, I think everything has to do with water. But the truth is everything has to do with water. Um, and so it's not inappropriate that we have a little bit of a conversation about water. So I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to do three things. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of what I describe as the global water crisis and what that means. For those of you who are maybe more focused on energy or, or some other aspect of this, what's really going on worldwide that we should be worried about in terms of water? I'm going to talk about the connections between energy and water, what some of us call the water energy nexus, uh, how water and energy are connected. And then for the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about solutions because um, at heart, I'm an optimist. Uh, I believe that we're inevitably going to move to a more sustainable future for energy and especially water. I'm not, I'm not a crazy optimist. I understand that that's not going to be easy. Uh, I understand that the path between where we are today and that more positive future is a difficult one, especially for certain populations. But I am optimistic that there are solutions out there, and I'm going to describe them for you. OK, the water crisis. Uh, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. This is the depressing part of the talk. So, so drink your sugar, orange juice, and your caffeinated coffee. Um, so one piece of that is the human dimension of it. Uh, there is a human crisis. It's the 21st century. We have failed to solve access to basic water services and sanitation services for hundreds of millions and, in fact, billions of people. There are probably 800 million people worldwide today that don't have access to safe drinking water, that don't have that faucet that they can turn on that delivers high-quality potable water to them. 
uh, perhaps two billion, two and a half billion people worldwide that don't have access to adequate sanitation. And that by itself is a crisis. Set aside all the other things I'm going to describe, the fact that we have failed as a society, as a planet, to meet basic human needs for water for everyone is, is uh, inexcusable. We know how to do that. It's not an economic problem. It's not a technology problem. It's not a water availability problem. It's a failure of society and governments and institutions. And of course, that comes with lots of bad things. The failure to meet basic needs for water and sanitation leads to water-related diseases, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, uh, that we in the richer countries of the world have for, for mostly solved. But I would also note that this is not just an international problem. Uh, we have failed for certain communities in the United States to solve basic water access and sanitation access. And if you read the newspapers or however you get your news today, uh, you know about the crisis at Flint that has been going on for years now where for institutional reasons and technical reasons, we have failed to provide safe water for the population at Flint. And we've known now about it for a long time, and we've still failed to solve that problem. And it's not just an urban problem, although we're now having that problem in, in Newark, New Jersey. But we've failed to meet basic needs for water for communities in the Central Valley of California. And you heard a little bit about Compton. Uh, but uh, uh, farm worker communities, disadvantaged communities in the Central Valley that don't have access to safe drinking water or adequate sanitation. It's a problem here as well. The water crisis is an ecological crisis. Almost every aspect of our ecological challenges today can be tied back to the way humans take water out of the system or because of the things that we put back into the system. We dry up rivers. We pave over and fill in wetlands and natural ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems. The vast majority of endangered species are aquatic species or species that depend for some aspect of their life on the hydrologic cycle that, that we are now influencing. So it's an ecological crisis as well. There are absolute scarcity issues. We are running up against what I call peak water limits in places where populations are growing and economies are growing and expanding beyond the natural availability of water. And as an aside, let me emphasize part of this problem is a population problem. And we don't talk about population much. Uh, we haven't had a population conversation here. Most environmental conferences I go to don't have population conversations. But this is a population problem as well, and we need to acknowledge that. And part of my history is I spent, I spent pieces of some summers just over the mountains at the Gothic at, Gothic at the Bi Rocky Mountain Biological Lab with uh, Paul and Ann Ehrlich and John Holdren and John Hart doing research. And Paul and Ann Ehrlich raised the population question, when was the population bomb? 1968. Uh, and yet it's not a sufficient part of our conversation. We have a contamination problem, human and industrial wastes that even when we have water, contaminate water. It's a food issue. 80% of the water that humans use goes to grow the food that we eat. And so this is, a, this is an agricultural issue. It's a food issue. It's a diet issue as well. How are we going to grow food for the seven and a half billion that we have now, or the eight billion, or the 10 billion, or the 11 billion people, when we're already stressing our agricultural lands, we're drying up our rivers. Uh, that's an, it's an agricultural problem, it's a food problem as well. It's a political problem. One of the things we do at the Pacific Institute, where I work, is we uh, address the issue of conflicts over water. Political conflicts, violent conflicts over water. We maintain something called the water conflict chronology, which looks at conflicts over water going back literally 4,500 years to ancient Mesopotamia. And the bad news there is that the numbers and severity of violence over water is growing today. It's not shrinking. We're seeing more and more of these issues. And water is a trigger of conflict. Water is a target during conflicts that start for other reasons. Uh, water is a casualty of conflict, as we've seen, especially in the Middle East, in Syria and Yemen in recent years, but worldwide. And of course, it's a climate issue. 
Uh, I'm a climate scientist in part by training. I'm a hydrologist. I work on science and policy together. But climate change is a water issue. It's the hydrologic cycle. Water, water and climate are, are intimately related. And as we are changing the climate, we are fundamentally altering the hydrologic cycle. Higher temperatures, more demand for water, more evaporation, changes in rainfall patterns, changes in extreme events, floods and droughts, rising sea levels that will contaminate coastal aquifers. Uh, the climate issue is a water issue in many, many ways. That's the bad news. Uh, let me talk now about this issue of the energy and water nexus and how they're closely connected as well. Good morning. So water and energy are tied together. It takes an enormous amount of water, it turns out, to produce and use the energy that we use. Power plants are one of the largest users of water in the United States, water for cooling. And maybe not surprisingly to this audience, the worst offenders are our big thermal power plants, our big fossil fuel power plants. Uh, as much as 30% of the water that humans use in the United States goes to cool thermal power plants. So water is an energy issue on that score alone. And uh, interestingly enough, what's best from an, a water for energy perspective? Solar and wind are best. And so there are advantages on the renewable energy side for our water system for getting off of thermal power plants. But it turns out it takes a lot of energy as well to collect and treat and distribute and use and then dispose of our water. So it's energy for water and water for energy, those are very tightly tied together. And we typically have thought about energy over here and water over there, and we don't think about them together and we don't understand the consequences of ignoring the fact that they're tied together. And we don't understand the advantages of thinking about them together. The possibility of solving energy problems by solving water problems or solving water problems by solving energy problems. But the reality is, if we think about them together, solutions become much more apparent and much more successful. Let me give you sort of a, a mundane, not so mundane example from just three days ago. I could give you many different examples. But three days ago, California passed a new regulation that regulates uh, little outdoor lawn sprinklers. It's a, it's, it's a little regulation it puts a, a pressure regulator in sprinklers so that no matter what the pressure of your water system is, your outdoor irrigation is much more accurate. Because sometimes our pressure goes down and then you're not, you've set your sprinklers for something and all of a sudden you're not watering enough or the pressure goes up at night because we're not using it in the water system and you're over watering and water's running down the street. It's a little thing, you would think. It turns out this one regulation as it's fully implemented in California alone, is going to save 450,000 acre feet of water a year. Now, for those of you who don't know the water world, that's a lot of water. That's more water than the city of San Diego uses in its entirety. So 450,000 acre feet of water a year, fi over 500,000 megawatt hours of energy a year will be saved by that one little regulation. And it's a water regulation, but it has water and energy implications. So here's another reason why we should care about that. So a lot of the water San Diego uses, now this is California in general, but a lot of the water San Diego uses comes from the Colorado River. And we're sitting here in the Colorado River watershed. And the Colorado River doesn't reach its delta anymore because we use, we and Mexico together, use literally every drop of the Colorado River. So it's a little example of a little thing that we can do that has enormous water and energy and ecological implications. And I could give many, many other examples, but I won't. So I have five more minutes, which is perfect. I wanna talk about solutions. Uh, I, again, I said at the beginning I'm an optimist. I truly believe there's a sustainable future for water out there and more broadly for us if we can figure out how to put the pieces together. And so let me talk about what I call the soft path for water. Uh, I have to obviously acknowledge Amory, 
who wrote the book on the soft path for energy many, many years ago. I met Amory first in 1978 uh, in California when he was there lecturing on this. Um, the idea about the soft path for water is rethinking water, the way we have to rethink energy. It's the 21st century and we're still using 20th century technologies or 19th century technologies or 19th century inf institutions to manage our water. We need to do things differently. And the components of this are rethinking supply of water. Supply of water used to mean build another reservoir, dam another river, suck another river dry, or drain another aquifer. That was the way we thought about supply for water. And there are plenty of places around the world where new traditional methods of supplying water are still needed, although I would argue we have to think about communities and ecological needs in a different way for supplies of water. But there are new ways of thinking about supplies of water, and let me give you one example. You flush your toilet, you take a shower, that water goes down the drain. It's sort of like it rains and you turn on the faucet and you don't know what's in between. You don't know what's in between flushing your toilet and where it ends up. But in many places, if we're smart, we've built a wastewater treatment plant because we have laws. And we collect that water and we treat that water, typically to a very high standard, and then we throw it away. We can treat that water now to any standard we want, including potable standards, and we can reuse that water. And we throw away literally most of the water that we have used once and treated to a high standard. We throw it away, but that can be an asset, not a liability. And in fact, in more and more places, we're now thinking about wastewater reuse and treatment in Singapore, in California, in Israel, in other places. We're thinking about wastewater as a new source of supply that doesn't mean tapping another river, draining another aquifer. And there are other ways with modern membrane technology of, of expanding our supply of water without taking more water out of the natural system. But the other side of this is demand. How are we using water? And again, the energy parallel is critically important. A vast majority of the water that we use we use inefficiently. We could do more with the water we're taking out of the system. We can grow more food with the water we're using for agriculture. We can wash our clothes with more efficient washing machines. We can water our lawns with more efficient sprinklers. We could get rid of our lawns. <laughs> so the demand side of the equation, just like it is for energy, the demand side of the equation for water is critical. And let's rethink demand. Let's rethink scale. We have large centralized systems when maybe what we need is small decentralized systems for water. We could use smart economics. We price water inappropriately, or we don't price it, or we subsidize bad things, or instead of subsidizing good things. We could develop markets for water that are more efficient, but we don't do that. And I have to add a comment here. There's a human right to water. There's a legal human right to water, so declared by the UN in 2010. But water is also an economic good. And as we think about balancing the human right to water and water as an economic good, we can rethink the way we manage our system. We need smart institutions. Nelson Mandela said, interestingly enough, about water, it's one thing to find flaws with our current institutions. It's another thing altogether more difficult to redesign those institutions for the future. And that's what we have to do for water. We need 21st century water institutions. And maybe that means managing energy and water together instead of separate utilities. Uh, maybe it means having communities more involved in the way we think about and deal with our water. But it's a difficult thing, but that's what we have to do. And finally, we have to think about behavior and personal choices and our individual roles here. Hunter gave a wonderful talk yesterday, which I hope most of you heard, about individual, about a lot of different things. But one of the things she talked about was our individual responsibilities and our individual actions. It gets back to our diets. 
our choices about food, which have implications for agriculture, which have implications for many things, including especially water. It's our choices about landscaping and lawns in the Western United States. Uh, our choices about buying bottled water or not. Our choices about voting or not. All of those things make a difference. All of those things are things that we as individuals can do to move toward this more positive future. So I'm an optimist. I think we can get there. I understand how difficult that will be. Uh, my optimism has been severely challenged in recent years. But let's move toward that positive future that I know we can achieve. Thank you very much.